All right. I know that you are offspring of Abraham, yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. I speak of what I have seen with my father, and you do what you have heard from your father. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. That is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, we were not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell you the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. All right. Thanks, Aaron. All right. Well, as we jump into the word of the Lord, I'm going to ask God to teach us and lead us this morning. So would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. We pray that you would lead us and teach us. God, even as we just sang in that song this morning, that you are a father that we can run to, that we no longer need to hide from. And so, Lord, we pray that you would um, expose us this morning and that we would not run, that we would not hide but that we would trust you. That's what you teach us today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, when my wife and I were engaged to be married, we went through some premarital counseling. And uh, one of the things that we did in premarital counseling is uh, the couple that we were meeting with that had been married a lot longer and were a lot wiser than we were, they gave us these like... Uh, workbooks like this homework and these packets of these questionnaires that, that we would have to fill out. And the rule was is that we would fill them out, but we couldn't like work on it together. We couldn't show one another our answers. It was just kind of like, hey, work on yours and, and, and you know, I'll work on mine and my wife Jackie will work on hers and then we'll come together in our session and we'll, then we'll look at it together. And uh, one, of these, one of these workbooks was uh, all of these questions about like, hey, whose responsibility is it in marriage to... And then it's just all these examples. And you'd have to write like the husband or the wife. And so it's like, in, in marriage, whose responsibility is it to do the dishes? Whose responsibility is it to take out the trash? Whose responsibility is it to cook the meals primarily? Like all of these questions that are just kind of like, okay, what are you going to write down? Uh, and then there's some that are like, heavy ones of like, okay, whose responsibility is it to, if you have children, discipline the kids? Whose responsibility is it to oversee the budget or manage the investments or all these sorts of things that would go from being like really simple tasks in a home to like really deep responsibilities. And we would come together and we would exchange our answers and have several moments of like, you think that's supposed to be my responsibility? That's definitely your responsibility, right? And it was just exposing to us, not, not, not who's right and who's wrong. The, the whole point of the exercise was to expose to ourselves and to one another how much our thinking has been influenced by the home we grew up in, right? Because there's not necessarily like a right or wrong answer to so many of these questions. Like whose responsibility is it primarily to do the gardening? I don't know, like whoever wants to do it or, you know, like some of these, like it doesn't necessarily matter, but our, our opinion might be strongly influenced by what we saw growing up, the home we grew up in, right? And there's a common adage in, in the counseling world that as we go on to our adult lives, no matter where we go, we carry our family of origin with us everywhere. And right? if you've ever gotten a chance to be a part of counseling or therapy in any degree, some, you know, there's that like cliche question of like, well, what happened in your childhood that makes you feel this way, right? But there's actually like a lot of legitimacy to that, that everywhere we go, we, we do carry with us the family of origin that we come from, 
right? The, our, our, our relationships with um, our mom or dad or a guardian in our home or the, the different experiences we've had growing up, how we interacted with, with discipline or the things that we saw happen in our home, how we felt being in our home. We carry all of those things like long past when we're out of the home in, into our adult lives. And it impacts so much of how we see the world and, and how we experience things, right? To where if you go through counseling, it's kind of uncomfortable because sometimes you start to discover like, oh my gosh, the whole reason I'm thinking this and feeling this is because of something I experienced here in my home. And it kind of can be really uncomfortable, but it's, there's a lot of truth to that adage that we carry our family of origin with us everywhere that we go. Our physical family of origin greatly impacts our everyday life. But Jesus tells us that our spiritual lineage is of far greater importance than our physical lineage. It's your spiritual lineage that will ultimately determine who you are, what you do, where you spend your eternity far more than your physical one. We're going to find out what he means by that this morning. As we come to this section in John chapter 8, Jesus has just finished telling a crowd of Jews that they were slaves to sin and needed to be set free. That's what we talked about last week. And their objection to Jesus saying, you are slaves to sin and need to be set free. Their whole objection was, don't call us slaves. We are sons of Abraham. And if you know your Bible story, Abraham is the father of Israel. He's the man that God chose to be the leader of a, of, a, of a people, the people of Israel. The people of Israel did not exist, but God came to Abraham and he said, Abraham, and said, through you, I will make a great nation. I, I will bless the whole world through you, Abraham. And it's ultimately a promise of Jesus who would come through the line of Abraham, come through the people of Israel. Jesus was a Jew and he would be the one that blesses the nations through bringing salvation to all who believe. But back in Genesis, when God establishes Abraham and builds the people of Israel, something started to happen to these people, which is what we see happening right here in John chapter 8, is these Jews now became confident that because of their physical lineage, they had some sort of um, extra favor with God just from their DNA. And Jesus is going to push back on that claim in this passage this morning. He begins in verse 37. He says, I know that you are offspring of Abraham. That's no surprise to Jesus. He, he knows this. And he knows that when these people hear about sin and a need to repent and turn from sin and, and follow Jesus as a savior, that their objection is going to be, well, we, we don't need any of that because we're sons of Abraham. We have this extra special DNA that gives us extra favor with God. You see, the Jews leaned on their Jewishness for their acceptance. They leaned on their Jewishness for their acceptance. They believed, up up until this point, we see it in this very chapter, that simply because we are in the offspring of Abraham, therefore God accepts us. Simply by our physical lineage. And what Jesus is pushing in on is this reality that until they were ready to recognize that their physical lineage didn't gain them any favor with God, they would never see their need for Jesus, let alone come to him. Until they were ready to recognize and confess that their physical lineage did not gain them God's acceptance. Truth is, you and I are not at all immune from that same exact thinking. That is not a Jewish thing. That is a human thing. That if we are honest, all of us have things in our life are are kind of in this default position of like, you know what? In general, God's probably fairly proud of me. He he kind of, in in general, he like accepts me. We've talked about this over the last couple of weeks a little bit that uh, we could go walk down the fourth street and ask almost anyone, hey, you know, what does God think of you? Or, hey, what do you, you think is going to happen when you're going to die? Do you think you're going to go be with God in heaven? Or do you gonna think you're going to go burn in hell? Like most people are going to be like, well, in general, I'm a pretty good person, so I'm probably going to heaven. Right? That's just kind of like our default perspective. And sure, we might have, you know, some bad experiences or some decisions we regret that might kind of play into that. But in general, humanity tends to have this default position that, you know what, God's like fairly cool with me. 
And we too, just like the Jews here in this passage, are tempted to find our assurance in so many things. Right? I, I'm fairly a good person. I'm, I'm, so, I'm kind. Like once I have my coffee and, you know, things are going my way, I'm fairly kind. I, I'm, I'm not too discriminatory as a person. I, I'm generally fairly welcoming and loving of others. Uh, I'll help somebody out, give them a helping hand when they need it. Heck, I even will I'll go to church. I try not to infringe on too many people's lives and decisions. I let them just be them and I do me. And I'm just kind of generally fairly kind. And, and that's, that's kind of pleasing to God. That kind of... Gives me, it gives me an, I would think God is fairly accepting of me to, to the point where ultimately if I die, he'd probably, yeah, you know, he'd, he'd accept me in because I, I'm not like some of these other people that we see or that we know. But friends, just like these people here, until we realize our resume doesn't gain any of God's favor, we'll never come to Jesus. Some of us think our resume is fairly impressive or at minimum, just fairly neutral. But our resume gains us no acceptance or favor with God whatsoever. I don't care what your background is. I don't care what your position is. I don't care the home you grew up in. I don't care the track record you have in your life. I don't care the, the people that speak highly of you. Your resume gains you no points with God. It is not as if God is perusing down from the heavens, looking down and is like, okay, look at this one. Look at the goodness on this one. The kindness. You got angels, you got to come over and see this one. This, this person right, gives, me, gives me glory all the time. They're so selfless. They never have a, 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 a judgmental thought that, 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 that's wrong about anyone. They, they're, they're, they're so giving. They're so loving. Like we, What do we got to do to get this one on our team? Do we have like the right draft pick to get this one on our team? Like We got to make this happen. Like That's not how God operates. And mostly because that's not what we are like. We aren't those things. By default, we are not good. We are enemies of God. We are rebels. We want to be our own gods. We want to be the ones that decide what's right and wrong for ourselves. We think we're better than God. We position ourselves as enemies of him. And the truth is from the scriptures is that there are no other means by which we come to God and are accepted by him than the merit of Jesus Christ. There is no resume out there impressive enough to gain God's acceptance. They are all like filthy rags to him. It is only on the merit of Jesus Christ that anyone can come to, G can come to God and be accepted and be welcomed in. It's not by our own merits. It's by the blood of Jesus We are saved by God's grace alone, through faith alone in Christ alone. That's the truth that Jesus is proclaiming that these people are unwilling to even see because they've leaned on their Jewishness for their acceptance. And we do a lot of the same. Here's a simple, quick little thought experiment. I want you to imagine for a second that, you're, that you die and you're standing before God at the gates of heaven. Just thought experiment, all right? And he asks you, on what basis do you think you belong here? Now, you might have the right theological answer to say really quick, but let's be honest for a second. What would be your go-to laundry list of answers of why you, as opposed to someone else, can come in here? There's a great preacher, a great Scottish preacher by the name of Alistair Begg, who preached the whole sermon kind of on this idea. And sometimes when somebody says something great, you don't try to re-say it, you just say what they said. I'm just going to read for you, very simply, the completion of this thought experiment from this preacher, Alistair Begg. Here's what, here's what he says. If you were to die tonight and get entry into heaven, what would you say? If you answer any of that in the first person, we've immediately gone wrong. Because I this, because I have faith, because I have believed, because I have done these things. 
He says, loved ones, the only proper answer is in the third person. Because he did this. Because he, and talking about Jesus. And he says this, think about the thief on the cross who turns to follow Jesus in his dying moments. And Jesus says to him, today you will be with me in paradise. The criminal on the cross. Think of him. He says, I can't wait to find that guy one day and ask him, how did that shake out for you? Because you were cussing the guy out with your friend and you've never been in a Bible study. You've never been baptized. You don't know a thing about church membership and yet you made it. How did you make it? And then he plays out this scenario of that's what the angel must have said to this thief on the cross as he enters heaven. What are you doing here? Which the thief probably says, I have no idea. <laughs> what do you mean you don't know? I, I, I don't know. And then the angel says, excuse me, let me go get my supervisor. And they get the supervisor angel who comes over and says, okay, just a few questions for you. First of all, are you clear on the doctrine of justification by faith? To which the criminal says, never heard of it. No idea what that is. Oh, well, what about, the, what about the doctrine of scripture? Do you believe that all of these are the divinely inspired words? I have no idea what those are. And, and he concludes this scenario by the angel asking this simple question. Well, then, on, on what basis are you here? To which the criminal says, the man on the middle cross said I could come. On the merit of Christ and Christ alone, the thief on the cross is with Jesus in paradise. It's not to say that all of these things are not important. But at the end of the day, knowing doctrine, being baptized, church member, all, all these things that are good, beautiful, biblical things are not the basis for our salvation. It is only through the merit of Jesus Christ. Because the man on the middle cross said I could come. Unless we are reminded of the gospel, every day we will find ourselves trusting ourselves. Believing that salvation depends on me. And it's only the cross that strips us of our arrogance and pride that wants to say, no, 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 but we are sons of Abraham. And brings the good news to us that says, no, it's only by the merit of Jesus Christ that you can be sons of God. So Jesus says, I know that's how you feel about yourself. But the truth is, you actually say one thing, but display another thing. You ever had that experience at a store when you're walking the aisles and you feel like you see a killer deal all of a sudden? You see something that is 50, you know is $50, but it is labeled as $25. And you're like, this is unbelievable. I just found the best deal ever. And you take that thing and all of your joy and excitement to the register and you hand it to the person checking out and they check it out and it says $50. And you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa wait, wait, wait. No the, no, the sign says $25. That's why I've now set all of my hopes on getting this item and brought it here. You displayed it as $25. Even though right now you're saying it's 50, your display says 25. Now, most good retail stores, what are they going to do? They're going to give you the 25 because they know that's their mistake, not yours. Right? Ultimately, in, in, in good retail businesses, they, they understand that the communicative, communicative value of their display is worth more than what the person working in the cash register says. And Jesus is saying that you are claiming that you are sons of Abraham, followers of God. But everything you display says the totally opposite of that. You're displaying something very different. And he says, if you were Abraham's family, in verse 39, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing what Abraham did. But ultimately what they're doing, Jesus says, is you are seeking to kill me while also claiming to be Abraham's children. That's not what Abraham did. 
So the question is, well, what, what did Abraham do? What, what is it that they should be doing? Well, we got to go back to the book of Genesis where Abraham lived and understand what Abraham did. And I think there's two main things here that he's hitting on that Abraham did. The first is from Genesis chapter 18, where we get this picture that Abraham joyfully welcomes Jesus and gives him a place of honor. Look at Genesis chapter 18. This is worth looking at. This is an awesome story. Genesis, Genesis chapter 18. Starting in verse 1. And the Lord, that's God, the Lord appeared to him, Abraham, at the oaks of Mamre, and he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up, Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, there were three men standing in front of him. When he saw, now, real quickly, oftentimes throughout the Old Testament, God will um, sometimes appear in human form. These are sometimes called theophanies or uh, sometimes when it's a, a thought that it's actually Jesus, the son himself appearing, it's called the Christophany. It's this appearance of God to where he, before Jesus takes on flesh, he appears on earth in, in human form. And that's exactly what's thought to be happening here. He lifted up his eyes and looked. Behold, there were three men standing in front of him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O oh Lord, if I have found favor in, of your, in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while I bring you a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, quick, three seahs of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. And Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. And they took curds of milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. You keep reading this story later. But this is, we're told at the very beginning of this chapter that the Lord is the one appearing to Abraham. It's thought that this is Jesus appearing with maybe two other angels. And what does Abraham do when he sees the Lord? He runs to him, which, by the way, is not something that uh, elderly men would do in this context. You would never run. That is considered uh, disgraceful. But he runs to meet them and serve them and show respect to them and welcome them in and put on a lavishly generous meal for them. And then it tells us that Abraham stands by waiting on them as, their, as, as a servant. What is Abraham doing at seeing Jesus? He is joyfully welcoming him and giving him the place of honor which is precisely not what the Jews are doing at the coming of Jesus. They are rejecting him and seeking to kill him. And Jesus is like, you say you're sons of Abraham? That's not what Abraham did when he saw me. He rejoiced at my coming. Just to be a descendant of Abraham means nothing if you reject Jesus. That's what he's saying. And this is a truth we see all throughout the scriptures. Romans chapter 9 says this, For not all who descended from Israel belong to Israel. Not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring. Or Galatians chapter 3 says, Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham. The scriptures declare that it's not just physical lineage that makes you a true son of Abraham, makes you a truly part of the people of God. It's, not, it's never been simply physical lineage. Go read the Old Testament. There are very clear instructions for the people of God. If you don't follow him, you will be cut off. It wasn't just about your DNA, your ethnicity, your blood. It was about something deeper. And the New Testament picks up on that, that it's about faith in who God is that creates sons of Abraham. Because the second thing Abraham did was believe God. Like that, what was just told us here in Galatians chapter 3. Abraham believed the promises God gave to him and the scriptures tell us that through his faith, he was counted as righteous. This is the, doct the doctrine of justification by faith. It's the truth that we are all sinners and yet simply, 
simply through faith in who Jesus says he is and what he's done, that we get to be justified, which means we are declared righteous, not through any works that we did, simply by faith that Jesus did all the works for us. It's the doctrine of justification by faith that happened in Genesis. Abraham believed and was justified by his faith. That's what Abraham did. That's how you be a son of Abraham is you follow that same pattern of believing in Christ and being justified by faith. It's what Romans 2 says, for no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical, but a Jew is one inwardly. And circumcision is a matter of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. The New Testament affirms what Jesus is saying here, that simply to be a physical descendant of Abraham has ultimately never been the thing that's gotten anyone any favor from God. It has been by doing what Abraham did, believing in the Lord, and through the simple faith of believing on him as the Savior, you get declared righteous. That's the way it always has been and always will be. That the simple ethnicity did not gain them God's acceptance. But that's what they seem to be believing here. But Jesus is saying, true sons of Abraham are the ones that believe in me and are counted as righteous. And then he starts to hint that they might have a different father than they think that they do. It's about to get crazy. Jesus. Here's where he goes. They answered him, Oh, shoot, where'd it go? Uh, Jesus said to them, oh, no, no, here we go. Verse 41. You're doing the works your father did. So obviously some other person. They said to him, we're not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. There's a lot happening there that we don't have a a ton of time to get into this morning. But uh, they're essentially hinting at the fact like, uh, Jesus, you're kind of calling us uh, essentially spiritual bastards uh, that we don't have a, a, a spiritual father. What, what are you saying about us? Are you, are you questioning the legitimacy of our births? And they kind of throw it back at him like, hey, we weren't born of sexual immorality. There's some thought here that they may be actually prodding Jesus and getting at the controversy surrounding Jesus' birth and who, who really was the father of Jesus. Oh, Mary just got pregnant. Like that whole scenario, the scandalous scenario of the virgin birth. All right? they, they may be prodding him with that. We don't know for sure. But they claim to have God as their father. And and then Jesus says, well, if God were your father, you'd love me because he sent me. So what else you got? Like I'm from him. So if you love him, and you'd love me, but you don't. So he's not your father either. No, you have a very different father than you think. In verse 44, he drops the mic. He says, you are of your father, the devil. Oh my gosh. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth. Jesus knows the simple biological truth that sons look like their fathers. Right? To this day, just look at pictures. Sons look like their fathers. Not just physically though, especially in this culture, a son looked like their father in their trade. What your father did, you do. You carry on the the family business. You get trained and, and raised up in what your father does as a son. Your father has certain deficiencies. Guess what? The son's probably going to have those same deficiencies. Your father has certain skills and abilities. He's probably going to craft them and and bring up his son to, to carry on those same skills. In so many ways, a son looks like his father. It's a simple biological truth. But Jesus is saying there's also a spiritual component to that as well. You resemble your father, the devil, your spiritual father. And by father, I think he means this, the one who has authority in your life. 
the one whose mark you bear, whose heart you put on display, the one who shapes you and guides how you think and what you do, the one whose voice of influence is guiding your every step. I think that's what he means by father. And he says, you are doing the works that your father did. Because what I see happening in, in how you treat me is the same way that the devil treats me. And he cites a few examples. He says he's been a murderer from the beginning. which that, That's Satan's goal, by the way. His goal is death. It was his goal in the garden to bring death to Adam and Eve and therefore all of the human race, to separate us from God, creating spiritual death. Jesus will even tell us later in the book of John that the, his goal is to steal, kill, and destroy. His objective is death. And his method is lying. He doesn't stand in the truth. He lies. From the very beginning, if you go all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 in the Garden of Eden, Satan's first words are lies. Did God really say you can't eat of any tree? Surely you will not die, as God said. He's, he begins with lying. It's his method all with the goal of bringing about murder and death and destroying you. But the best summation of the works of the devil could be summed up in this idea of unbelief, of refusing to believe who Jesus says he is. Those are the works of the devil. It's unbelief, which is primarily what Jesus sees in these people. They're also trying to murder him but they are rejecting him. They are refusing to believe in who Jesus is. Unbelief is a mark of the influence of the devil. Paul's letter to the Corinthians will talk about how those that don't believe, they don't believe because the, the devil has blinded their eyes from seeing the glory of the light of Jesus. And Jesus says to them, because because I tell you the truth, you don't believe it. Like that's a really important statement that Jesus makes. He doesn't say, I tell you the truth, but you reject it. He says, because I tell you the truth, you reject it. The reason is your father is the devil and he's a liar. So all you know is to side with lies. So it's precisely because I come telling the truth that you reject it. Because you're so influenced by your father, the devil, who's a liar and a murderer. That is heavy. This passage is really holding before us the hard reality that there's really only two fathers we can have. It's either God is our father who directs us and guides us and saves us and has authority in our life or it's the devil. And that might sound really harsh and it might sound really offensive, and it might sound really narrow-minded, or maybe too dramatic. But if it does, it's only because we don't think sin is that big of a deal, and we don't think Jesus is that big of a deal. But he's telling these people that there is a father in your family of origin that you might not even realize who has impacted your thinking and your life. And it's the devil. The truth is, the devil is our original father who's infected our thinking, infected our lives. Now, we aren't, we aren't born into this world sons of God. God has created everyone, and so in that sense, I guess you could say we are all God's children, but that's not how the Bible describes it. The children of God, the sons and daughters of God, are only those who are saved, not just by being human. No, actually, the Bible tells us we're born enemies of God. We are, we are born haters of God, rejectors of him. That's actually our default status. And so by that default status, our father is not God. He's not the one who we follow and trust and, and obey. No, it's the devil. Who's in, impacted our thinking? We don't like to think about it, but the truth is 
He has, and maybe he's impacted our thinking more than we realize. I mean, how do you think about your money? Is it through a Christ-centered lens or is it more in line with the heart of the devil? I mean, let's be honest. We tend to think of our money as mine. And my, my, my finances are, are something to be, to, be, to be served and worshiped because they are the ultimate source of power in my life. They will provide the security in, in my life that I need. Friends, that's, that's, not, how, that's not how Jesus thinks about money. That's the influence of another father. Or how we think about sex. It's just about me and what I need. Getting my needs satisfied. It's not about giving. It's not about caring. And, and anything that tries to come into my life to, to limit and suppress the expression of my sexuality is trying to rob me of joy. Friends, that's not how Christ views sex. Sex. That's the influence of another father. Or conflict. Right? When we get in conflict, our, our default mode is to just tend to think, if they would just, if only they would have not, or if they could just realize that what they're, it's never a, it's never a me problem. It's always a them problem. It's always the burden on their shoulders to fix it. That's not, that's not Jesus' perspective. It's not how he handled the conflict between sinners and himself. No, he came to bring reconciliation. We could go on and on and on with this. God's sovereignty. Yeah, we might confess God is sovereign, but what is our everyday thinking like? No, actually, I'm sovereign. If I don't do this, this isn't going to happen. I won't be provided for. I won't be cared for. I know what's best. I'm sovereign. All this thinking, that's not necessarily influenced by the word of God, by Christ himself, by the gospel, but actually by a different father. And Jesus is saying, there's really only two options. It's either the Lord or it's the devil. And it's meant to jar us and make us feel uncomfortable. Here's the hard question I think this passage confronts us with. If Jesus himself were here to examine your life, would your life display the heart and will of Christ or of Satan? What you do reveals who you belong to. Jesus says you're, you're not doing what Abraham did. You're doing what your father, the devil, does. We must hold that intention with the gospel reality as followers of Jesus now that Jesus says that now because of his work, what we do no longer defines us. It no longer defines who we belong to, right? Because of the gospel, our sins do not determine who we are, who we belong to, our eternal reality. We, we have to hold that in, in, intention as well. Because rather, who we belong to now empowers what we do. The gospel has made this switch to say before coming to Christ, what you do shows to everyone in the world who you belong to. But now in Christ, those that will come to him and turn to him and follow him, he gives you a new identity, changes who you are, which then empowers you to live differently. Because the answer to that question that I just gave of who's, whose heart does our life display Let's stop fooling ourselves. And we display a lot of, of sinful, evil thoughts and attitudes and unbelief and all these things that, if we're honest, are more in line with the devil. That's okay to confess this morning. We need a new origin. We need rescue from that. It's like, like, that's literally the basis for coming to Christ is confessing, yeah, I'm in that place. I need help. We need a new spiritual family. We need a new spiritual father. We need an adoption into a new family. And good news because that's exactly what the gospel is all about. It's all about us being rescued out of one kingdom and brought into another kingdom. 
It's about us being rescued from an evil, abusive, lying, murderous father and brought into the family with the most loving, self-giving, generous, gracious, patient father of all time. And the way to get in is not by proving yourselves. It's not by your physical heritage. It's not by your ethnicity. It's not by your blood or your DNA or where you grew up or who your parents are or what your job is or what your position is. It's only through the merit of Jesus Christ by grace alone. In Christ, we can have this new rescue, this new family where we have a father who doesn't take from us but gives everything for us. Jesus is not a murderer and a liar. No, he's one that gives life and tells the truth. That's who he is. And Jesus says to this crowd, whoever is of God hears the words of God. That this adoption into this new family comes through hearing the word. And by hearing, he doesn't just mean like just the sound of it in your ears. He means hearing it, receiving it, believing it. It's through hearing the word with faith. That's how we're adopted into this new family to be rescued, to have this brand new identity. And yet, church, it is possible to be part of God's family, to have him as your father, and yet we continually keep calling back the old father to ask for his counsel. If we're honest, some of us are still doing that. And we need to, we need to cut the line. We need to turn from that, turn from the ways we keep saying that we're in God's family, that we trust him, and we follow him, but we keep calling for the counsel of the devil. The invitation for us is to turn from that, to repent, to come back to the Lord. He's asking them here to repent of their confidence and their heritage and come and trust in Jesus because they're slaves to sin and they need to turn from it and repent and follow him and be saved. Dietrich Bonhoeffer uses this example of repentance where he says this. He says, if you board the wrong train, it's of no use just running along the corridor in the other direction. You got to get off the train. And yet the truth is there might be some of us that have been adopted in, into the family of God. And yet we keep jumping on these, these trains of sin and just thinking, okay, I need, I need to stop. And so we just start running the opposite direction that the train is going, thinking like, okay, here we go. But no, we need to get off the train. Some of us, honestly, we, we need to make some hard decisions about repenting and turning from the sins that we keep running to. And stop lying to ourselves and just thinking, yeah, I'm just running the other direction. It's totally fine. Like, no, get off of the train. Like Jesus has su a, such a better place for us. And let's just be honest about whose influence we keep running to. And remember, that's not my father anymore. He doesn't have a voice of authority in my life anymore. I have a new father and a new family. I want his voice. Because the gospel of Jesus announces good news to all of us that regardless of your family origin, your background, your status, your ethnicity, your income, your accomplishments, your failures, all of these things, everyone who repents and believes in Jesus can be adopted into a new family with a new power and a new identity that says you are sons of God now. And then what what the Bible does for us so beautifully throughout the New Testament is it calls us back to remembering this new identity, this work of Christ to change us, fundamentally change us, and says, now live out of that place of identity. Rather than what, what these people were doing was to try to live to earn a certain identity. The gospel says, you've now been declared as righteous sons and daughters of God. Live from that place, from that power, go forward. 
And the scriptures paint a beautiful picture of this. Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to read a long section here and then we'll close. Ephesians chapter 5. Now, rather than hearing this, as I read this, as a list of demands for you to follow, I want you to hear this and listen to this as this is the picture that God paints for his people. Because of their new identity, because of the work of Christ, he is now committed to providing the power and producing a people that look like this. Ephesians chapter 5, therefore, because of all that Christ has done for you to give you a new identity, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. You hear that family language. You have a new father. Be imitators of God as beloved children. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. But sexual immorality and all impurity or covetousness must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. Let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place. But instead, let there be thanksgiving. For you may be sure of this, that everyone who is sexually immoral or impure or who is covetous, that is an idolater, has no inheritance in the kingdom of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not become partners with them. For at one time you were in darkness, but now you are in the light of the uh, you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good and right and true, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of the things that they do in secret. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. You and I cannot accomplish that. We have no power to do that. What God is saying, he's saying, this is who I am making my people to be through my power. Through this new adoption into this family where I fill you with my Holy Spirit. I empower you. I've changed you to being sons of disobedience, to being children of light, to being sons of God who can now mirror me and image me to one another and to the world. Not through your own strength, not through your own hard effort, but just by looking to me. I will do these things in you if you come to me and you follow me and you trust in me. And we can come to him because we come to him by Christ's merit. We can come to God with confidence. We can come to him confidently with our sins to say, God, I'm sorry. I have actually been walking differently, not, not, not into the way you've called me. I've been walking away from you to actually do some of these things you tell me to run from. And you can come into his presence and confess and repent with confidence that he will forgive you. Why? Because you come not based off of your record, but on Christ's. So you can come confidently knowing you will receive the mercy you need. And the deep comfort is if you hear his word this morning and respond in faith to him, it's deep confirmation that you're his. Because if you weren't, you'd hate that word. It's exactly what he says. So there's an invitation for us this morning to come to Christ again, not based off our merit, but his. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father,
we just confess before you this morning. Our waywardness, our desire to trust in our own strength, our own records, our own resumes to gain your acceptance. Would you help us this morning to really believe the words of the old hymn that says, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. Lord, we want to come to you this morning with empty hands, saying we have nothing to give, nothing to offer that is impressive enough. We come to you broken, needing you, needing your grace. And Jesus, you love to be a savior. You love it when we come to you with that posture. So Lord, that's how we come. Lord, if there are things this morning that you are calling us to repent of, would you give us the courage and the faith to do so right now in this moment? That right now, we can turn from those things and turn back to you. Jesus, what good news that you came to save us and that you now welcome us in based on your merit. We want to respond to you now. I pray this in your name. Amen.